this morning, I want you to know that my God is the God of the corner. My God is the God of the corner. And in the law, Leviticus chapter 19, God tells his people, Now when you reap the harvest of your land, you shall not reap to the very corners of your field, nor shall you gather the gleanings of your harvest, nor shall you glean your vineyard, nor shall you gather the fallen fruit of the vineyard. You shall leave them for the needy and for the stranger. I am Yahweh your God. Leviticus 19, 9 and 10. And at first that may seem like a strange command to us. Why is God telling us when we harvest to build inefficiency into the process? I thought God was all about stewardship, about us making the best possible use of his resources. And yet God says, do not harvest the corners of your field. In this very passage, if you were to read down only eight verses further to Leviticus 19, 18, you would find the second greatest command in all of Scripture. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. So I do not think we can afford to write this law off. Our God is the God of the corner. And I'm going to submit to you today that God knows the center of your heart by the corner's of your harvest. God knows the center of your heart by the corners of your harvest. Come with me on a journey today. Let's go to the book of Ruth. Ruth is a tale of two migrants. A woman named Naomi had moved to the land of Moab with her husband Elimelech. They were Israelites. They had to leave Israel because of a famine. They went to Moab. They sojourned there about 10 years. Uh, Naomi's two sons uh, got married. Uh, but after, after that 10-year period, Naomi's husband, Elimelech, had died, as had her two sons, leaving Naomi in a very tenuous position for someone in the ancient world. Uh, she was going to face a life of extreme hardship and difficulty until she succumbed at an early age to the perils of hunger, hard work, and starvation. Life was going to be difficult for Naomi. And about that time, she got word that there was now bread in the land of Israel. So Naomi tells her daughters-in-law, you know, we'd better part ways. I think we'll do better if we each go our separate ways and and make it as best we can. You should go back to your family's house. I'm going to go back to Israel. And the two girls cry. One of them kisses her and says goodbye, but the other daughter-in-law clings to her. And this daughter-in-law, her name is Ruth. Naomi repeats her command, Ruth, I said go back. Your sister-in-law, next slide, has gone back to her people and her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. Naomi's having a faith crisis right here in the middle of our Bible. Did you know that? Naomi is literally having a faith crisis right here. She says, it is exceedingly bitter to me that the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. Naomi is hurting and suffering so much, she feels like even God is against her. And she says, Ruth, you should go, you should leave. But Ruth makes an incredible confession of faith. Listen to her words in Ruth 1, 16 and 17. She says to Naomi, do not urge me to leave you or to return from following you. For where you go, I will go. And where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, and your God shall be my God. Where you die, I will die, and there will I be buried. May God do to me, and more besides, if anything but death separates me from you. Do not miss the significance of this verse. Ruth has been raised as a Moabite. She has been taught to worship the God of her people. And she has grown up worshiping Chemosh, the Moabite god or God. She has been taught that this is how we worship God. But in this one moment, she is staking everything on the God of Israel. Your people will be my people. Your God will be my God. I'm going to tie the rest of my life. I'm going to tie my fate to the God of Israel. 
Ruth has just taken a massive step of faith. I want you to appreciate that. She has left her people, her God, her country, her everything. And is throwing her confidence on the God of Israel. And let me tell you, whenever someone does that, God takes notice. My God is the God of the corner. Next slide. So they come to the land of Israel. And pretty quickly, they need to eat. So Ruth goes out in the field, and the Israelites had a custom. You could go out, and you could pick up the grain behind the reapers. And uh, you could try to satisfy your needs if you had no fields of your own to harvest that year. You were allowed to harvest what other people had dropped, and that was in the law of God. But what I love about Boaz is how he interacts with her. We're told um, that Boaz is a righteous man, and uh, Boaz comes out to the field, and, and the first thing we hear out of his mouth is his greeting to his harvesters. The Lord be with you. And they answer, the Lord bless you. We can tell Boaz is a guy that talks openly about his faith. We can tell very quickly thereafter he notices someone on the edge. Next question, whose young woman is this? Boaz looks over his field, his harvest, how the work's coming along. He knows most of the people, but there's one lady over there on the side he does not know. So he asks his foreman, who is that lady? And she says, oh, that's, uh, that's Ruth, the, the girl from Moab. She has come back with her mother-in-law. And pretty quickly, Boaz gets the story and says, wow. And I love that Boaz does not stop there. Boaz comes over to Ruth and says, now listen, my daughter, Ruth 2.8, do not go glean in another field or leave this one. Keep close to my young women. Let your eyes be on the field that they are reaping and go after them. Have I not charged the young men not to touch you? And when you're thirsty, go to the vessels and drink what the young men have drawn. She fell on her face, bowing to the ground, and said, Why have I found favor in your eyes? I'm a little unimportant foreigner. He says, All that you've done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband has been told fully to me. And how you left your father and mother in your native land and came to a people you did not know before. The Lord repay you for what you have done, and a full reward be given to you by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. I love that Boaz takes it on himself to say, Ruth, you made a great decision. Welcome to God's country. Here in the land of God's people, things work differently. You made a good decision. Welcome under the wings of the God of Israel. He takes care of all of us here. Do you see what Boaz is doing? He is a great, great man of God. He's, he has already taken initiative, and he is strengthening and building on that little confession of faith that she made. She, she gave all she knew to God, and Boaz is already taking it upon himself to make sure that she finds herself at home among God's people. I love this guy. Now, if we go to the next slide, I want to ask you a question. This is for your Levite bar exam preparation. I know we have some attorneys in the audience, and I know you had to take the bar exam, so uh, I need your full attention. Define the meaning of edge or corner in the Torah, for example, in Leviticus 19, 9, and 10. Choice A. Next slide. A one-inch wide row of grain stalks. Choice two. A two-foot swath of grain. Choice three. What do you need it to mean? Which one's the right answer? Have you, have you gotten your answer? Next slide. Best answer? Wait for it. What do you need it to mean? See, the law is subject, this law is uniquely subject to interpretation of God's people. And you think I'm kidding, but seriously, God put that law in the Torah, in Leviticus, I believe, to challenge the legalism in our hearts. In many areas, God spelled out exactly what he wanted people to do. He told them, this is what you will do to walk in, in my favor. This is how you will please me. You know, you need to give a tenth of your income that will support the Levites and the tabernacle and what have you. You'll do this, you'll do that. All these ceremonial laws. And people have this view of God as being stiff and legalistic in the Old Testament. But this law was, was sandwiched right there in the Torah in Leviticus to challenge the legalism in our hearts. Because God wants us to say, what is the meaning of the edge. And God didn't say how much. He just said, leave something. God intentionally put a law in the Torah that would require interpretation to fulfill it, 
every time you put it into practice. Because that's the heart of God. The truth is, you're not going to know the correct meaning of edge or corner in God's sight until you look around the field and see the people on the margins of your field that year. Some years, the right meaning is going to be a little bit of grain. Other years, times are hard, and you're going to need to leave a lot of grain. If your heart is centered on God, he'll know, and you, he will give you the ability to keep that law. But you will not keep this law correctly out of legalism. It cannot be done. See, our God is a relational God. He has always wanted our hearts. He has always wanted us to have a relationship with him first, and then second, to have a relationship with our neighbors that honors him. God wants us to care deeply about the plight of those on the margins of our life, on the margins of society. So God puts laws like this in the Torah to call our hearts after his own. Uh, I love that Boaz's mindset lives out this commandment. There's a commandment in Deuteronomy 8, 17, and 18. Next slide. And God cautions Israel that when they come into the land and when they eat and are filled, he says, do not be lifted up in your hearts and do not say, my power and the strength of my hand have enabled me to get this wealth. For it is the Lord your God who gives you power to get wealth. You're to remember him. He is the one that gives you power to get wealth that he may confirm his covenant that he made with your fathers. In scripture, wealth is not an evil thing. Wealth is a blessing of God given to Israel in response to the covenant. And because God is the one that gives us the power to get wealth, God also gets to define what we do with that wealth. God's attitude isn't one that we should go and harass the wealthy or occupy them. God's desire is that people use the wealth he has given them for his purposes. And Boaz lives out the very spirit of that law. So next slide. I guess the best answer to how, to how much grain defines the edge is how much does she need to harvest today? And you will not keep that law without a relationship. So first he asks questions. He tries discreetly to discern what her needs are. He learns, oh, she's harvesting for two. She needs to do pretty well today. And he's watching how much grain she's getting. Boaz is a farmer. He knows about what it's going to take to get by. And he's concerned there's not enough. So in this story, a few verses later, he tells his workers, hey, drop a little bit of grain for her. And if she kind of gets close to the sheaves of grain, let her go. Do not give her a hard time. In fact, make sure you spill some for her. Later in the story, he's going to tell her, here, give me, give me this, this cloak. And he fills it up with grain, her, her overcoat, so that she can carry that home. And the first day, after a day of gleaning, she comes home with more than a five-gallon bucket of, of harvested grain. Because she has come under the wings of the God of Israel, the God of the corner. And God is being incredibly faithful to Ruth. My goal is for us today to see something about the heart of God. I want us to take a journey to understand what God is trying to teach us about himself and about his heart for people on the margins and in the corners of our life. Next, next slide. So question, how do... I leave the corners when I don't even have a farm. That's easy enough for Boaz, but some of us haven't farmed in generations. So how do we keep the law today? It's actually easier than you think. Next slide. Does anybody go to lunch? Well, that depends if this preacher ever quits talking or not. If I get off the stage, you'll go to lunch, right? Well, one thing we can do is leave great tips. Oh, yeah, that's nice. That's common sense. Has anyone here ever worked in the food service industry? Get the hands up high. Okay. Has anyone ever worked in the food service industry and gotten a good tip? Okay, I'm going to take a quick poll. You have three choices. One, do you get your best tip on a weekday? Two, do you get your best tip on Saturday? Or three, did you typically get your best tip on Sunday afternoon? Who got their best tips on weekdays? Who got their best tips on Saturdays? Anyone get great tips on Sundays? Uh-oh, all well, the hands went down. I think I saw one. And you know, there have been a lot of articles online in recent years, but there's pretty good evidence that 
Sunday Christians, I'm not talking about this church, but as a nation in America, Sunday Christians are actually not very good tippers. And that's a challenge for us. Because I love how Boaz, who who knows that Ruth is going to associate his activity with the way things work in Israel, Boaz takes it upon himself to show Ruth how things work in God's economy. He takes it upon himself to take of the, the generous provisions that God has poured into his life and to share that blessing with Ruth. So as Christians, I think we were challenged to be great tippers. This is a tract you can get, and you can fold it in half. And they had to put a reminder on their website, guys, please don't leave this as tips, because this tract company was getting really nasty emails from servers. They fold this $10 bill in half, leave it on a table. Someone's like, oh yeah, I pick it up, and it's a tract. Oh, you got to be kidding me. So they, they had to go back and put a reminder on their website, guys, if you leave this as a tip, please leave some money with it. I would agree. But further, I would say, I'll I'll just give you a hint. If somebody is working on Sunday in the morning, it's probably not because they're pursuing mammon and fattening up their 401k with a huge taking. If somebody's working in a restaurant right now, I have a funny feeling they have some needs in their life that are driving them to be in a restaurant on the weekend instead of having a chance to be in church or with their kids or whatever else they need to be doing on Sunday. So literally, most of us, when we leave today, are going to go and we're going to encounter people on the fringes. And you have an opportunity to welcome someone under the wings of the God of Israel. They can tell you've been to church. There's just a way people dress. And we have a unique opportunity every time we go out in God's name on Sunday afternoon to welcome people under the wings of the God of Israel. And when you leave that tip, say, God bless you. Thank you. You have served us really well today. Well, I didn't get good service today, so I'm not going to leave a tip. I think we got out of the business of being served long ago. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. When I'm able to go out to eat, my tipping has very little to nothing to do with the quality of service I received. I know that's what our culture says, but as believers, I think we got out of the business of being served long ago. And I think we can take our cue from the Chick-fil-A servers and say, how may I serve you? That's the attitude we should have toward our servers. That's the attitude Boaz has toward Ruth and toward the people on the margins of his field. How can I extend God's blessings into your life? All right, let's keep rolling. What about your workplace? You know, there are some amazing stories that come out of Homewood. And Brett has been doing this, uh, this Faith at Work series. And... Uh, as a, as a bit of a conclusion to that, I wanted to share with you a story of what one Homewood member does to put the practices of, of Leviticus 19, 9, and 10 into his workplace every day. Next slide. Every day, a Greenbrier tree service opens in prayer. This is uh, Robert, Brother Robert Reed, who attends here at Homewood. Uh, Robert has had this business since 1988. And... One day, he made a vow to God before he got his company. God, if you give me my own company one day, every day will open in prayer. They have not missed a day yet since 1988. And this very week, a Homewood member uh, caught them in in their yard and snapped this photo and sent it to Robert. So Robert shared it with me as we were talking about his crew. But this is not your ordinary tree company. I asked Nancy, Nancy, did you and Robert even like trees when you got married? (laughs) She said, not especially. But... You know, thing, life happened. Robert got laid off from his iron scrapyard after three years here in Birmingham, and, and he had to do something. So he threw a chainsaw in the back of a car and started a company. It wasn't that he liked trees. He just needed a job. But Robert learned as he went along in this job that God had plans for his company. Next slide. He said, I, you might look at this and you might say, we're just a tree company, right? Next slide. Wrong. We're a ministry where God's grace can flow in a way it can't from a pulpit. You may not know, but Robert started his career as a minister and then worked in an iron yard in Birmingham for two or three years after that, but then felt called by God to start a company to give him an opportunity to practice Boaz-style justice in the lives of the people around him. And Robert said to me this week as we were talking about Greenbrier Tree Service, literally, the first man he hired had, had been a former addict some years ago, and he was clean, but struggled to get a job and, Ro- and he needed a job so Robert gave him a job and he was a believer but then a few weeks later he said Robert I have a friend who needs a job <laughs> and 
Robert said, well, I'll, I'll meet him. And again, this guy had a past. Therefore, he wasn't hireable. He's not going to get a job that has a cash register involved because people won't trust him. But what's a man to do? What kind of honest living can he make? So Robert talked to the guy and realized, yeah, he's willing to work. He wants a job. I'll hire him. They're sitting in the truck two weeks later. Robert asked the guy once, so how's your relationship with God? He said, oh, I'm going to go to hell when I die. Whoa. Robert said, uh, do you want to do that? He said, no, but if God knew my past, there's not a chance he would take me. Robert said, I beg to differ. And very shortly thereafter, this man confessed his faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. He was able to welcome him under the wings of the God of Israel. He told me another time, a person with a special needs background, something near to my heart, even a guy that had an autism spectrum background. He was a good guy and a hardworking man, did not have a criminal past, but just had a little bit of a, uh, some challenges related to his special needs. And, and again, he needed a job. And someone, he had a good reference, and Robert checked it out, and it looked like it could work. But he said he hired the guy, and it was a challenge at first because they had a hard time communicating, and, and he had a hard time handling complex tasks. But Robert said, because I believe that God called me to show mercy, I put up with a difficult situation. One time he wanted a bunch of logs that a lumber truck was going to pick up, and he came back, and the guy had cut them all into rounds. And so Robert had to use a pickup truck to haul all of it off to the landfill, several loads. And, and the guy that was going to haul it for him couldn't use it anymore. So there were challenges, but, but he stuck it out because he feel, believes that God has called him to show mercy and to use his company as a vehicle to do that. So he felt called to show mercy to this guy, and he kept him. That guy has been working for him for more than 20 years to this day. And outside of God's economy, that guy would not have been able to get a job. He'd be sitting in a corner somewhere wishing someone would hire him, but would say, I'm unemployed. Next slide. Robert said, there is an undercurrent that everything we do as God's children must include mercy. Anytime we leave that out, we're no longer representing God. And our lives are no longer God-centered, but self-centered. Because our God is the God of the corner. And he knows the center of our heart from the corners of our heart. Robert Reed and Brian Labou co-lead this company today and, and work together, and they do a great ministry. And I'm just, every time I hear about it, I'm more impressed. The things that God has done through that business. And there's other people here that have businesses as well and that, that use them in godly ways. But I want to challenge us as believers. If, if our God is the God of the corner, we should join him there. To the extent we're able, and as God makes it possible, we too should be people of mercy who look for ways to show mercy to people that have been cast to the margins by, the, by, the, by a cold, cruel world. As, as God's people, we are vehicles of his mercy into our world. And I want us to see that. Next slide. I don't know how, um, how your investments do, but I want to show you an incredible investment strategy. If you get a bank account, you usually want it to be FDIC insured or insured by the National Credit Union Association. You want that account insured so that your money will be guaranteed. Check out this security. Whoever is generous to the poor lends to the Lord, and he will repay him for his deed. Now, Scripture generally says you cannot get God in your debt. He does not owe anything to any man that he should repay him. But if you could, this would be the way to do it. This isn't like, oh, I put my tithe in the offering. You should do that. The Scripture, the, uh, the Judeo-Christian uh, teaching is consistent all throughout that we should generally give God at least a tenth of our income. Good financial planning wisdom generally says we should set aside another tenth for our retirement. But then... God additionally says, I'm the God of the corner. What about the people on the margins? Now, what are you going to do for them? God refused to systematize this part of his law. You cannot handle this exclusively through a benevolence ministry. This has to be handled relationally by a relational God to people in need who need to be touched through the actions of his children. And if you engage in this, if you are generous to the poor in your personal life, this is between you and them. It's a pass-through entity. Your loan is really made to God when you give a gift to the poor. 
and God will mark that to your account. You can take that to the bank. Next slide. Sell your possessions, said Jesus, and give to the needy. Provide yourselves with money bags that don't, do not grow old, with a treasure in the heavens that does not fail, where no thief approaches and no moth destroys. Same thing as Jesus says. If you're investing, why don't you invest toward eternity? And how do you do that again? This isn't your tithe. This is a gift to the poor. Okay, next slide. What is the meaning of the Ruth story? A young widow risks everything for faith. Next. A landowner lives out God's justice. Next. Their lives converge. They have a son named Obed. Obed, we're told in scripture, passes his faith to his grandson named Jesse. Jesse, the grandson of Boaz and Ruth, will have eight sons, the youngest of whom we call David. Next slide. By the time David was only a teen, this wasn't something he went and developed in his adult life. As a teen, he had been raised so well that he had a just and righteous heart that God himself said was after his own. Where do you think he got it? Do you think there's any chance for, for ten generations that the family of David is going to forget that Boaz and Ruth story? about the God of the corner, about that generosity. Is there any chance that that story wasn't told a hundred times to the boy David who learned about God, the, the father to the fatherless defender of widows and orphans? Where do you think he got that heart after God's own if not from his father and mother and grandfather and grandmother and great-grandfather, great-grandmother? It's not a coincidence. Next slide. My God is the God of the corner. Next slide. He is still seeking, he still seeks the man or woman after his own heart. And next slide. I believe God knows the center of your heart by the corners of your heart. As you leave this morning, you have an opportunity to extend God's justice and mercy into our community. This is personal. This is the part of the law that could not be systematized or codified. God kept this part of the Torah personal. And I want to ask you this week to become a personal vehicle of God's mercy in the community in which you live, in the restaurants in which you eat, in the business in which you work. My God is the God of the corner. He is always there with the downcast and marginalized. And my God knows the corner of your heart by the corners of your hearts. Let's go live the story of Ruth and Boaz this week in our community. If you have any prayer needs, you can go to this chapel and one of our shepherds will pray with you as we stand and sing.